so for those of you, how many are interested in multi-decadal climate in their work? Okay, so for those who are only interested in the seasonal, this is going to be a little bit of a, maybe a little bit less relevant, but I think you'll find something that connects it. Six pitfalls to avoid when using climate projections. So this is the second time I've given this talk. First time was a little bit earlier this year in Princeton to a group similar to this. And I started by saying, you know, I know this isn't the title you wanted to see. You would prefer the title that says, Best Practices to Follow When Using Climate Projections. Right? That's what Bill Hook would want. Right? That's the optimistic one. Here, I'm, I'm a downer. It's the negative stuff to miss. I'm totally contrary in this case to that YouTube video. Sorry. But there's a reason for it. And the reason is because to try to come up with best practices as a blanket rule for the use of climate projections isn't going to work. Why? Because what's best practices for you and your application may not be the best practice for you and your application. Or you. It is problem dependent. You have to think about the problem you're doing and not just turn the crank because you got a data set you think might work in your software when you read it in. So that's the reason why I'm going to talk about six pitfalls instead. The overriding themes, right? I like when the summary slide is up first and I can all go back and see. Model output is not the same as observations. Yeah, I know you know that. But in what ways? Is it not like observations? That matters. What also matters is the way you approach the data. Okay. How many people here have degrees in civil engineering? Okay, I'm not going to insult that many people. Okay. So remember the other day where I said, you know, we don't really want to stereotype? I'm not stereotyping. I'm reporting. So I do a decent amount of working with different groups or speaking to them. The group I have the hardest time getting through to about the difference between an initial value problem and a boundary condition problem and the difference between how models and observations aren't the same are not the ecologists. It's not the people interested in human migration in Indonesia. It's the civil engineers. They've been trained in a way of looking at the world through this prism about validating models this way. You know, I've had great conversations with people, or more listening, listen, about how one designs culverts for highway, right? And how we want to adapt to that and change. It's good. But it comes down to my lab that's not the same observation. So just be aware of that. We'll talk about some of the ways it is. Best practices are often application dependent, I already mentioned, and as I piped in my two cents earlier in the week, data is not the same as knowledge. Okay, now I'm the old guy again. When I first got into the field, if you wanted to do climate impacts work, you could not go to a data portal, right click, and go on your merry way. You needed to talk to somebody in a place like where I work. And you got to talk to us nice. Because then what we would do is we would, you ever seen those old movies, those big round tapes? We would put data on those round tapes, put it in a special envelope and mail it to you with four pages printed out on how you might be able to read it. Uh, okay, that's about data transfer. That's the data. But what about the knowledge? That didn't happen unless you talked to the climate scientist, to the modeler. So you had that conversation. So here's the analogy I use. Back in the day, you needed a prescription to get climate model output. So if you have, if you have a kid, a kid wakes up with a sore throat and a fever, you got a couple choices. You can bring them to a doctor, or you can decide you know exactly what it is. And go to the CVS or whatever and get some over-the-counter medicine. You might be right. You might be wrong. Or you can go to the doctor who could do a little strep test thing and see, oh, yeah, okay, we got to do that. So that's kind of the difference. Back in the day, the information did not, the data did not spread as much. That was a hindrance. But now, in some ways, 
Not that it's too easy, but what's happened is we've managed to divorce the exchange of the knowledge along with the data. You right click, you have it, you use it, you've lost all the caveats. How many of you actually read all the papers that are referenced from that data set that you downloaded? Yeah, we got two. Very nice people who are perhaps truthful. Okay, so, so the bottom line, think before you turn the crank. Number one, don't assume a climate model projection data set is appropriate for your study just because it was used in some previous work that was landmark in your field. You need to ask yourself, are the assumptions that made some data set proper, hopefully, for use in a prior study, the same for this great new project you're working on? What you want to avoid is writing something in your paper or in your manuscript that says, as in the landmark study of a big name person in my field, here in, I think I love that word, here in, climate projection data sets from some data archive are employed as input to drive our climate impact models. As if that's all the justification you need. Somebody else used it in a study, I'm going to use it, I'm done. Why might not, that not be a good idea? Here's a hypothetical example, totally. Based upon monthly mean temperatures and precipitation, yes, big name in my field, showed that whatever your favorite fruit tree is can be expected to shift from its current geographic range, showed here, to there. By year 2050 under a mid-range greenhouse gas emission scenario. And this is big in your field. And now what you want to do is follow up on that and say, I'm not just interested in where this tree can be grown. I'm interested in what its yield will be, right? Not just where it is, but how much it'll produce. <coughs> so I can just go and use the same data sets that Big Name used to figure out where they would be in order to figure out what my agricultural yield would be. You see, because this, where these trees grow, it's dependent upon some like monthly mean climatologies. You look at how much uh, temperature and precipitation it gets in certain months of the year, you know, can't get too hot, can't get too cold, and you figure out where it is. Now you want to figure out what the agricultural yields are, ah, but for that you're not interested in monthly means, you need the growing season length, you need the number of, of chilling days, you need higher frequency data, you're interested not in the means, but you might be interested in the tails of the distribution. It's a different problem. So, something that produces a credible representation of monthly means may not do the full distribution well. For example, if this curve here was observations, and this is what some model-derived output was, you got the mean right. That would be good for big name. But if you're interested in what the growing season like, the, the last day of the frost to the first, in the first day of the frost, the tails are going to make the difference. And suddenly that data set isn't too representative of the historical period. Do you really want to use that in the future? So you have to think about the details of what your application needs and then think about doing an assessment of what works for that. That's number one. Number two, remember that different climate models are not truly independent. And the future scenarios are neither random nor systematic. You can go to those data portals and you don't just right click for one data set, you can right click for 10 different global climate models produced by different institutes. You can right click for three different emission scenarios, low, medium, and high, and you get a whole bunch of data. So much, it looks like a really nice probability density function when you put it together. And uh, I don't know if Derek has the plan, but I have a, a PDF of this with notes and other things I can share with you so you don't have to bother trying to write down references that are in here. So this one might be actually of some value. So here's the example. You can actually consider somebody could do a study where they can say, I'm going to look at four different emission scenarios because that's what they used in CMIP 5. And I'm going to look at 30 different years. So that'll give me 120 different data points for 120 different months. And I can look at, oh, let's say I'll pick nine climate models that do, that aren't too bad, that do reasonably well for my area. Okay, I'm up to 1,000. And I can actually look at two different ways it was downscaled, and I now have more than 2,000 points 
And I can take all those and I could use that data into my impacts model because I just happen to have an impacts model that isn't too computationally intensive. And I can put them all together and say, well, you know, here's what the distribution looked like in this historical period and here's what it looked like in the future. And that's all fine. That's well. That's good. You did it. You did it. You turned the crank right. But don't. You shouldn't say that now you have a prediction that there's a 50% chance that the average value will be that or greater in the future. It's not a prediction. And those emission scenarios, there's no likelihood associated. They're low, medium, and high. No one said that one's more likely than the other, that they're equally likely. No, no, no. They're just three representative of something or for emission scenarios. And those different global climate models that you downloaded, they're not independent either. There was a study done a few years ago that looked at about 25 or so models and suggested that maybe there was, yeah, like maybe eight, 10 different independent models. When you thought about, you know, they, a lot of them share DNA. They have a common pedigree. So they're not all independent. So don't treat it as tempting as it is that you turn the crank that it just has a probability density function. You have some things that are representative of a range, of a sample, of an envelope of possibilities, but it's not a prediction about probabilities. Three, resist the urge to ask in the name of data volume reduction. Right? I just gave you a reason why you don't have to right click as much. Because I get all these things, I can't use it as a PDF. Ah. So, the inner civil engineer in you might just say, just tell me which one is the most likely emission scenario and which is the single best GCM, and I'll use that in my study. Taking on the civil engineer. Sorry. But I got that exact same question from somebody in the Army Corps at one meeting and from somebody on some senior executive committee of the American Society of Civil Engineers. So that's why I link it with that group. But just resist that idea. Because we can't say which is the best for your application. Which is the low, most likely emission scenario. And I'm not just trying to be difficult. How do you know what the most likely emission scenario is going to be for 50 years from now? This is humbling. Let's turn the clock back 50 years. What was China like 50 years ago? How many people were predicting that China under the rule of Mao Zedong, is going to become a capitalist dynamo and the largest greenhouse gas emitter. I don't think there are all that many. So why should we think we could nail and put probabilities about what emissions are going to be like 50 years from now? Right? And those are the inputs that are driving those things. So how, how can we say this? So you want to sample some set to get this envelope of possibilities, or at least acknowledge that these things aren't known with certainty. You don't want to have false certainty. There's multiple sources of uncertainty. And uncertainty, uh, Susan Hassel is going to be talking to you later this week. She'll probably tell you why you should never use this word uncertainty the way I am. But we can talk about a range of possibilities. And the reason you don't use the word is because outside of science, the meaning of the word uncertainty means you know nothing. So it's not that good. But the model isn't the same as observations. You have these different sources of uncertainty. You need to think about having different ones and capturing that difference. You ought to be aware of what the different sources of uncertainty are. And here's a good paper to start with from Hawkins and Sutton in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, an accessible uh, paper. It's two figures. We'll get a little bit to the spatial scale issue. We're looking at global average surface air temperature, decadal means over a 100-year period, and the different colors represent if you had an envelope of possibilities produced by the, the different climate models around the world, what's the spread due to? What fraction of the spread is due to which type of factor? The blue is what they call model uncertainty. That just means if you have 20 different models and everything else was the same, you told them to give them all the same greenhouse gas emissions, that for the short term, it's just that those different models have gone off in somewhat different directions. The green part is what we call scenario uncertainty, that we don't know what people are going to do in terms of how much CO2 and other things they emit over time. So if you're only interested in the next 20 years, as, as Dean Moore said, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But as we go out 
farther, but as you go out farther, then the what will people do ends up becoming the dominant source of uncertainty or the reason that the range gets as large as it is. And the other part of the wedge is what we call internal variability. That's, that's just the natural fluctuations, the stuff that's not predictable, the El Ninos that come and go. They're always going to be there. You're going to have the natural variations as well. And if you go from the large scale to the smaller scale, still, the whole British Isles, that's pretty big. It's going to be bigger than probably the area you're interested in. It changes the relative weights. As you go to smaller areas, that internal variability matters more. There's more noise. It's twitchy. You're not averaging over as large an area. And there's more difference from model to model. So be aware of that. Four, though generally considered as creating value-added products, processing of the raw output of the global climate models also introduces some of its own uncertainties. So the example I've already discussed has been statistical downscaling. Well, if you were to use two different statistical downscaling methods, you're going to get two somewhat different answers. Maybe they're a little different. Maybe they're a lot different. It depends. You won't know until you look. But if they're different, that's contributing to the uncertainty in this definition that's talking about the envelope of possibility. Now, a lot of people don't think that right away because they view that downscaling is addressing the model biases. If you do it for the period where you have the historical data, where you're doing the training and the cross-validation, you're actually compressing the models and you're reducing the spread. But when you go and apply that to future projections, ah, the envelope starts to spread out again. So there's assumptions. As long as there's assumptions, it's introducing a different bit of uncertainty, and you could look a little bit more on that. So if I just had to say what the different sources of uncertainty in, in climate model projections were, first, what will the future emissions be? All right, we talked about that. Scenario uncertainty. These are the global climate model inputs, the rate, things that become the radiative forcing agents. Second source of uncertainty, how will the climate system actually respond? We use the global climate model to give us an idea of this. But different ones will give somewhat different responses. So that envelope is part of what we call the global climate model uncertainty. The models are good, but very complete and they're not perfect. And the third one is how will naturally occurring internal variability affect the system? The El Ninos that come and go, the flap of the butterfly's wings, that's really not predictable. But then we can have two other bits. The data that you often download has gone through a regritting process. It could be done conservatively so area average remain the same, but it's going to change your variability statistics. So if you're interested in just means over a large area, you're probably okay. If you want to study the variability statistics, if it's been regridded, it's probably tweaked it. Downscaling uncertainties. Again, they're going to give you somewhat different answers. Be aware. And then, finally, the bit that you care about if you're doing impact work. How will it change in the climate effect crops or viruses or prairie chicken or economic growth or human migration? Are any of those things, well, you have some uncertainties in whatever the models you use or your analysis routine. So you have a cascade of stuff. Five, be aware that large scale skill in climate simulations that does not equate to small scale skill. Advocacy groups, <laughs> knowing or unknowingly, use this a lot. I was at a, a few years ago at a meeting with environmental journalists in, in uh, Florida. And there's this nice talk given by someone from a wildlife fish advocacy group. And he started off by showing IPCC results. Climate change is unequivocal. Most of the change in the last 50 years is due to human activity, blah, blah, blah. Look, there's 90% certainty. And there's less of this bird in the Everglades, and we know it's affected by climate. Hence, we're 90% sure it's humans and climate change that's affecting that. OK, you can't, yeah, I know. You all wins, but. I hope you all wins. But there's a sliding scale. There's other things that can happen as well. You just have to be aware that a large scale skill isn't going to necessarily equate to small scale. You need to do a little bit of analysis on that. And if you just get to a question of detection attribution, 
that's the same idea. You may be able to, can you detect that there's a change and can you attribute what it's for? It's a signal to noise question. As you go to the smaller scales, you're going to have more noise. Six, averaging multiple projections of a particular emission scenario together can have several benefits. If what you're interested in is a mean response and you want to beat down the noise, average together different climate models. It's been shown the average of like 20 climate models is closer to observations than even the best individual model. That's telling us that the different errors in the models are somewhat random. So they kind of average out. That they're not all making the same systematic error. That's good. So if that's your application that you're interested in, or the means, you're fine. You're golden. If you're interested in mitigation and trying to get people on Capitol Hill to do something. But any un, un, non-linearities of the underlying physics are going to be lost. So think about your application, what matters to you. And again, I'll, in the PDF, it'll have some, some references you can go. So now I'll finish with this as a note of caution. I first showed this in Los Angeles at a meeting of the Association of Science and Technology Centers. Think science museums and those people. I've worked with a couple of museums putting together exhibits. It's really a neat way to learn. You, 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 know, you don't get paid for it, at least I wasn't. But you get to have a good feeling about it, and you learn about communicating that way, too. So I have kept running up against one, one problem. And it's good to work with like museum curators and, or other communicators. They can help you simplify the message. You and me, well, me. You tend to have this detail, because it's the details that actually give the credibility to your science, and how do you, how do you pare that down to their minimum? So you're never going to see, if you were to run a climate model, which we did here, so this is a 10-member ensemble, exact same climate model, same CO2 changes over time, we just start with somewhat different initial conditions. Flash the butterflies, wings are different. At the beginning, temperatures go up over the North Atlantic, one degree in 50 years. Right? Is that what you would take away from that? You would never see this figure in a museum, or probably in a summary for policymakers. It's just a spaghetti. It's ugly. Nobody wants to see it. You scientists and your deep, that's why you need us museum folks to help you tell you how to tell the story. So what we can do is we can do like kind of like what the IPCC does. You can average all the things together. Now you get this nice smoother line, and you can have some envelope around the possibilities. This one's a little bumpier than most. You can do it as like plus or minus one standard deviation if you want. There, I just encompass the entire range. But you get the idea. So now it's, it's more accessible. It's easier to communicate. You simplified it. Or if it works for USA Today, you would create that line. You would do a least squares regression line, and that would be it. You got the same message, right? One degree of warming in 50 years. OK, everybody agree that's a more accessible? Oh, come on. You agree. You know it. OK. What would you rather look at to try to explain something to your aunt? That or that? OK. Now, we can't say any one of those is more likely than the other. So let's look at just one, that one. Now let's look at, oh, a six or seven year period. What do we see? One degree of warming per 50 years is your take on that. You can have four tenths of a degree of cooling in only seven years. So everybody hear about the hiatus? in warming that's disproven, all those global climate models that are crap because they didn't predict it. So when everybody looks at those summary figures from the IPCC that have that multi-model average and the envelope around it, do they ever see that sort of variability? No. So if that's the only message that got across is the smooth line, people would be surprised. Why would your audience ever think that something like that was possible? if all you ever showed them was a smooth line. So if you're doing climate impacts work and your climate impacts model cares about variations, well, you wouldn't just use the next model. So when I did this and gave this the first time, there was a woman in the front. And when I was doing the bit about, you know, this is why we have to work with you. We have a hard time communicating. You know, she says, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. It was, it was like, it was almost like a call response. She was, I could hear her saying, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. She had these experience working with science. Oh, tell me about it. Tell me about it. Then I got to this part, and the phrase that came out was, so I hit the, oh, shit. And it came out, and everybody heard it. Because guess who did that averaging? And, and I've done a lot of outreach with that. OK, thanks again.